So good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this plenary lecture. Today, we have the pleasure of having Professor Ralph Metzler as our plenary uh, lecture speaker. Professor Metzler, mathematical physicist, obtained his master and doctoral degrees in physics at the University of Ulm in Germany. And after postdocs on both sides of the Atlantic, he became associate professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada, and then full professor at the University of Munich, at the University of Tampere in Finland, and at Potsdam, where he's currently chair professor for theoretical physics. So many at CISA know Professor Metzer for his work in mathematical physics and statistical mechanics, which are fields where he made uh, several seminal contributions, particularly regarding fractional stochastic processes and anomalous diffusion. And for the latter topic, again, many of us know that he wrote a beautiful review for physics record that is one of the most uh, cited articles in the journal. And I think it has so far gathered more than 7,000 7, citations. So his uh, scientific activity is impressive by any standards that you can consider. He has authored about uh, 300 papers with number of overall number of citations in the order of tens of thousands. And uh, for this outstanding body of work, he has received uh, several recognitions and awards, including the Sigma Phi Prize, the Finland Distinguished Professorship from the Finnish Academy. He was appointed as Canada Research Chair in Biological Physics, and he had numerous fellowships, including the Emmy Noether and the von Humboldt ones. He's also a von Humboldt Honorary Research Scholar and Associate at the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics in Edinburgh, Scotland, and he is in the editorial board of many journals, including Physical Review. And last, but certainly not least, for the CISA community, Professor Metzler has supervised and trained numerous young scientists, about 20 postdocs and 30 PhD students so far, which are again impressive numbers. Now, before uh, leaving the floor to Professor Metzler uh, for his lecture, let me remind you about some practical details. There will be ample time for discussion and questions, but we will take them at the end of the presentation. And meanwhile, please check that your microphone and camera are switched off. Uh, I will also post a link to the slides in the chat. I, I have already done it. I will do it again for people that joined and we we'll do that again at the end of the, uh, of the lecture. Now, without further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Metzler for his lecture on fluctuations in uh, diffusive processes. Ralph. Thank you, Christian. I hope you all realized that I was blushing while uh, uh, Christian was, was too generous with his praise. Um, the picture you see here, I, I always like to start with a painting by Turner. Uh, you all recognize the motive and I expect to stand exactly there on Monday, uh, next Monday, uh, unless they cancel my flights again or something. I'm hopeful. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of diffusion, just a few slides, and uh, then come to the modern aspects that we want to address. Uh, and I want to convince uh, I, I want to convince you that you shouldn't average too much in the sense that I'm going to explain in the sense that we can profit from learning about the fluctuations. So, quite some years ago, 1828, uh, Robert Brown, a botanist uh, uh, in trade, discovered the motion of what he called molecules, small particles. Uh, that were taken from pollen grains of this plant and they were uh, of this size, so micron size objects. And as a biologist, he was concerned when he saw these fuzzing around in his little microscope, maybe these are something alive. These are little animalcules. So what he did, he, he took all kinds of inorganic substances, uh, uh, crushed them into small powders and saw the same active that they called it motion, this zigzagging of the little particles. And I quote from his uh, paper here, rocks of all ages, including those in which organic remains have never been found, yielded the molecules, these fuzzing particles in abundance. Their existence was ascertained in each of the constituent molecules of, of granite. And this is an interesting one, a fragment of the Sphinx being one of the specimens uh, examined. Now his studies, they, they got very widely known in the physics community, and we'll see the theorists later on, but um, especially they paved the way for a new way of approaching the question of the atomic nature of matter. And uh, it was actually Jean Perrin, uh, 
who later got the Nobel Prize in uh, 26, uh, he saw the early papers by Einstein and realized that diffusion measurements were a key to combining a microscopic process, the motion of these small particles he was observing, and a macroscopic quantity, Avogadro's number. And when we look at what Einstein derived, we have the uh, Einstein or einstein smolokovsky relation, where we have the uh, mean square displacement, it grows linear in time, and the diffusion coefficient we have here, according to Einstein, is thermal energy versus the mass of the particle and the viscosity of the environment. We can rewrite it by the gas constant, and here we have Avogadro's number. So Perrin's goal to uh, uh, pin down Avogadro's number uh, got enriched by these experiments, and what he did, he, uh, oop, uh, he used uh, small particles uh, made of some kind of a rubber, and uh, he produced these trajectories. Um, and between each of these turning points, you have exactly 30 seconds. So they were sitting in front of a microscope and recording these trajectories, uh, but you can see that they're too short for a statistical uh, evaluation. So the particles just, they got out of focus, they lost them. And Perrin's idea was then uh, to use each of these 30 second intervals and do an ensemble average by putting them all at the same origin. And then he could get this Gaussian cloud uh, that Einstein was predicting. And from the decay, from the width of this cloud for this 30 second interval, he could then deduce Avogadro's number. And his result, you can see down here, was actually pretty good for that time. Uh, one of the main uh, disadvantages, I mean, this is single particle checking in a way. We do it routinely nowadays. But the problem is that each of his particles was different a little. They could not manage to reproduce uh, particles perfectly. Still a problem nowadays, but was, of course, much worse at that time. So in comes, just six years later, this guy, Ivan Nordlund. Uh, he was uh, um, a chemist, I think, in uh, the University of Uppsala in northern Sweden. Uh, and he was very good in photography. So he had the idea of using a single particle checking experiment with a single particle evaluation in the following sense. So he used a setup that uh, was combining a, a, a liquid chamber with a, a, an imaging photographic plate that he could move. So these were photographic plates, pretty big. You see the, the plate here. And he just moved it as a function of time. He used a stroboscope and he produced trajectories like this one. This is a mercury droplet. You can see that it slowly sediments as function of time. That's just gravity and superimposed to the sedimentation, you have the Brownian motion of the particle. And now this is a very long trajectory compared to what uh, Perrin had, and he could then evaluate the mean square displacement, the diffusion coefficient from a single trajectory, and then afterwards, after he e extracted the Avogadro number from a single measurement, he would average over the results, and you can see that uh, uh, his uh, final result was actually quite impressive just six years after Perrin. And, my, and this actually caused a whole flurry of experiments, many, many papers published. And then came this one uh, guy here, Eugen Kappler, uh, and he's my local hero for the following sense. Uh, I show you here a picture from 1920. This is my little black, black forest village where I'm from. So this is the family house where I was born. And this guy Kappler just comes from up there. So uh, he's our local hero, and, uh, uh, but no one knows him anymore. Uh, I couldn't even trick uh, uh, a picture of his, was a long story. Anyway, his experiments, they were so good, no one tried afterwards. And uh, when we look at his experiments, we can again see this Brownian motion under different experimental conditions, but you see that qualitatively, this is not what you naively uh, uh, associate with Brownian motion, because normally it would uh, venture off very far, and here you see that these trajectories are rather centered. And this is because it's Brownian motion under confinement. So what you see here is actually probably the first measurement of the einstein ullenbeck process, diffusion in a harmonic potential. Now, how did he manage this? He used a very small mirror, 
that was uh, uh, connected to a quartz thread. And of course, when the air molecules lead to small uh, uh, elongations of the mirror in, in terms of the angle, you have the restoring force posed by, by the thread. And to zero order, to, to first order, this, this is a harmonic uh, force because the angles were very small. And uh, so he could actually get to these measurements. Beautiful paper you read. I had to measure after 10 o'clock at night because the setup was very sensitive. And at 10 o'clock at night in Munich, the tramway stopped operating. So uh, uh, this was already an experiment where he could see uh, influences from the environment like that. What you see on the right here, this is at equilibrium. So when he uh, uh, did not follow uh, the um, dynamics of the system, but he kept the film plate fixed, he could actually get the shadow image of the Boltzmann distribution, which is a Gaussian when we're in harmonic potential, as I write down here. And this is the corresponding Gaussian that he mapped. And this is a beautiful uh, uh, plot. I mean, he, he spent his entire PhD on this experiment. And when you look at his final results, this was spot on. I mean, this was the best measurement at that time. And people just said, OK, I'll not uh, uh, try better. So we saw that actually high precision measurements of diffusion processes, they have a very long history. Um, but they were, of course, limited to these micron-sized particles, very specific setups. And historically, of course, the progress that is behind this is linked to these three people. Uh, we have Einstein. This is uh, uh, Paul Langevin, the guy with the uh, stochastic force. And this is Marian Smolokowski, the uh, colleague who was working on these ideas in Poland. And of course, uh, um, Perrin was, was a good friend of Langevin and he told him about Einstein's papers and everything. So uh, this got the whole uh, uh, thing going. And nowadays, this is the situation we have. Let me first start with this strange uh, 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 schematic we have in the top left here. This is something that I encountered when I was a postdoc in the early days when people were talking about not Brownian motion, but motion that's still diffusive, but much more complex, anomalous diffusion with strange relaxation functions and so on. So this was typically stuff that people measured in condensed matter, and there they did not have access to single molecule resolution. So the idea was, we cannot tell essentially whether a complex signal that we measure comes because we have individual uh, contributions from local sites, from local molecules, whatever, that are very different from each other, or whether each of the local sites has a complex response as such. And I just have the same signal from every little point. And this is exactly where single particle tracking nowadays allows us to have uh, a beautiful insight. Uh, I give you two examples from two complex systems. This is from uh, supercomputing. Uh, this is an image given to me by Matti Javanainen. Uh, we work together uh, in Finland and Matti manages to simulate very complex model membranes uh, that contain loads of different proteins and I will come to this uh, later on. And these are uh, um, artistic renditions of experiments done by Yuval Garini at bar -Ilan University. And what you see here, these wiggles, this is the motion, or these are the different uh, motions of the end parts of the chromosomes in the nucleus of a living uh, cell. So this is the kind of resolution that you can achieve nowadays, a few nanometers, kind of microsecond, sometimes sub-microsecond resolution. Uh, and of course, in, in the um, supercomputing, it's typically uh, from nanoseconds to microseconds. Um, and all this delivers novel insights. I mean, we have these single particle uh, uh, traces that we can use. Uh, we can see traces, we can, we can see the origins of anomalous diffusion or, for instance, non ergodicity is very important for these systems because you take time averages. I come back to this later on. Can we explain the time averaged observable in terms of what we know from our typical theories? Typically, we calculate ensemble averages. And you will see it's not always possible. Sometimes you have to really calculate the time average. We have aging uh, phenomena that I will come back to, or heterogeneities of all sorts. 
And one of the main ingredients that I want to talk about are fluctuations and their distributions of given observables. We'll be talking about reactions for passage times and then look at our fluctuations in uh, the diffusion coefficient. And I should mention that these fluctuations, they're inherent for any system when you measure for a finite time. Even when you have a Brownian motion and you measure for a given time, of course, one trajectory will be different from the next. They're still stochastic. The results are random uh, variables, but of course it matters what kind of distribution they have, whether it's a narrow one or a broad. To illustrate what I mean, let me start with chemical reactions and uh, go back to the work of Smolukovsky that he published in 1916. So he was looking at the, the time that characterizes when a diffusing molecule hits a reaction center for the first time. Uh, and what he showed by solving the diffusion equation in a steady state is that the inverse time for this, the so-called reaction rate, is given by the spatial angle, by the size of the target, and by the diffusion coefficient of the diffusing particle. That's a very well-known result, but it's a mean number. Typically, when you open chemical textbooks, uh, physical chemistry, they always give you one number, the rate. Now we have much better resolution and we can, for instance, look at what are reaction rates like in a cell. So what you see here, these light spots, these bright spots here, these are uh, experiments, I should say, by the group of Sunny Shi at Harvard from a few years ago. And they can visualize when a single protein is being produced in the cell. And then at a later point, they can also visualize when does it arrive at the point where they should arrive, where it should bind. Uh, of course, the statistic of these experiments is not very high. You don't get uh, too many results to actually produce whole distributions, but uh, we wanted to know what can we say about these systems. Especially, these are not systems where you have macroscopic chemical uh, concentrations, where you have particle numbers of the order of Avogadro's number. We sometimes have very few particles of one given species in these cells, like, I don't know, five copies in a whole cell. Will the whole approach with these uh, chemical rates still work? And I will convince you no, because the numbers are fluctuate. And we can get an idea of this already. Uh, this is a work I did with Gleb Shanin a few years ago. We looked at what, how can we compare just two uh, outcomes of a first passage experiment. You will, we release the particle here, we require it to arrive there, and we quantify this by this uh, parameter omega, which compares the two uh, realizations. And when omega is very sharply distributed around one half, it means the process is reproducible. But for all kinds of Brownian motion, whatever, in a finite domain, it's violating. All these processes we looked at and typical distributions of this variable are very broad. So this was the first indication that maybe we need more than simple mean rates to describe these processes. Now, over the years, we worked quite a bit on these gene regulation uh, aspects, for instance. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a particle is released somewhere in a biological cell and it needs to bind somewhere else. And we looked at what happens to this when the something else it has to bind to is a receptor or, or, or on the DNA. So we looked at what is the influence of the configuration of the DNA. And while we were carrying this forward, at one point we did a simulation analysis and we realized that the typical arrival times in this system can be very, very widespread. And this got us thinking. And uh, uh, so everything I'm going to tell you now, of course, is not in a real cell. We calculated this for this spherical cow uh, uh, picture that we have, but we realized that when people in our biochemical uh, studies, biophysical studies, they want to find out whether uh, this perfect mixing and the rate approach works in, in even a small cell. We're talking about cells that can be as small as a micron. And it turns out that the distance actually matter. Uh, genetically, maybe from evolution, maybe it just works like that. Uh, when there's one gene on a DNA that encodes for one messenger molecule, a protein, that is supposed to bind to another gene, then typically these are very close by on the genome. 
So how come there was one uh, uh, picture that came up from the Murney group at MIT and they said, okay, if this is one gene that encodes for one protein that is produced by some biochemical machinery and the protein just has to bind to another site on the DNA, then it will be much more rapid if they're close by. So that was very qualitative that they said and we then sat down and we developed the path integral formalism. How can we include all the biochemistry like how the proteins are being produced and so on and find out uh, what is the signal at the second gene, the one that's being controlled by the first. And here you see some of the results. So this is the uh, concentration of the uh, signaling molecules at the target gene. And you can see that when they're very close by, these are the red lines, you see these very big spikes and they come from the protein production. It's bursty, this is what the single molecule experiments tell us. And you can see that you have huge variations in the, um, in the amplitude here. When they're very far away within the cell, I mean, this is one third of the diameter of the cell, you can see this dashed blue line, then these spikes are washed out and the variation is much more smooth. So the effect is not that uh, what I naively thought, we have this Gaussian cloud that spreads from your uh, initial position and it's just the amplitude that is higher, but it's taking along these big spikes that we believe will help in the precision of, of the regulation here. So we needed to, to understand more of the, the biochemistry involved in that. And when we look at the response of the target gene, it's being shut down much more quickly uh, by when, when they're close uh, to each other. So this then was in the background for a few years until I had a very good postdoc, uh, Alias Godetz, who now has his own group in uh, Göttingen. Uh, and I also did some work again with Gile Boshanin and uh, Denny Krebenko. And here is the answer to our, our part of this, this uh, issue. What is actually the distribution of times to get in a generic setting, in the spherical cow setting from one point to a target? So here it's a little bit different than in the previous case. Here we start with a particle here and the particle needs to get to a reaction center. This is what we can calculate. And you know, I was so naive when my postdoc came and he said, okay, let's calculate this. I told him, open a textbook, must be there. And actually it's not there. A simple system like this uh, is actually quite delicate mathematically to, to solve for the first passage uh, density. So we have two scenarios that, we, uh, uh, can, that we, we see in the results. Either the particle can move relatively quickly to the, to the target. And then you see, of course, that this is uh, the minimum time it takes to reach the target. So when you look at the density, the probability density for the uh, reaction times, this is uh, what, what you have in the short time limit. So this peak, the most probable time actually, this corresponds to direct trajectories from your point of release to the target. And then of course you have other uh, trajectories that first take you to the boundary, you lose memory of the initial condition and then the particle has to come here. Even worse, when there's a finite reactivity, when they don't react upon encounter or first encounter, but they have to first dance around, they escape again, they have to recome typical for biochemical reactions, uh, you have many, many attempts at these diffusion events. And so when we go from an ideal reaction, this is the, um, I don't know the colors, probably blue line. Um, this is the shortest reaction time we can have. Here they react immediately when they meet. And when the reactivity goes down, you see that it more and more gets defocused. So for these reactions, we can have orders of magnitude of, of reaction times. And how can we think of, of capturing this by a single number, the reaction rate? Um, the mean uh, reaction time I have written here, this is a classical result. Uh, and this actually corresponds to these arrows at the different curves. So when you have a big concentration or you repeat the experiment many, many times, this will be the relevant time scale. But let's say you have a, a thousand biological cells and they compete, which one will react first to a signal, then you will actually want to have the information about these time scales down here. So uh, um, we try to 
get this into the fields, it's very difficult to convince our, our people in those fields that maybe uh, one needs more information than a single number. So this was what I wanted to tell you about fluctuations of these reaction times that we have these very broad distributions uh, for these molecular reactions. Now let me take a step forward uh, and look at the diffusion of uh, actually relatively simple particles, but all of a sudden it doesn't look uh, that simple anymore when you look into more details. So this is a system or two systems that were studied by uh, Steve Granick's group in uh, Ulsan in Korea. Uh, he has uh, colloidal particles moving along nanotubes, or he has a colloidal particle in, in a gel, a, me a mesh of um, uh, actin filaments. And in both cases, when they look at the mean square displacement, it looks perfectly linear, like Brownian motion, also in this case. Uh, but then they looked at the displacement distribution. Naively, of course, you would have expected a Gaussian, but what happens is this is a log-lin plot and you see straight lines here. So at short and intermediate times, this motion is described by an exponential distribution. In this case, for the uh, nanotube, at very long times, you see a Gaussian distribution emerge. So there's a crossover from uh, exponential to Gaussian. In the other experiment, most likely because they don't have a sufficiently large uh, experimental window, they only see the exponential tails. And this got quite some attention uh, in the field more recently. For instance, you have exponential uh, uh, distributions for uh, the motion of little uh, worms, of nematodes. And of course, when you have uh, uh, people who are not used to plotting things in logarithmic scale, uh, this is an exponential distribution. Normally, we would plot it in, in a log lin plot, but they, they use this kind of uh, uh, plot. And this is the cumulative, and again, they see these exponential uh, distributions. Um, and uh, so how can one explain all this? In Granik's uh, uh, papers, they use a very simple approach that is actually going back to papers in the early 80s, I think, where people were wondering what happens when particles can change their diffusion coefficient on the way. Uh, and this is then uh, later on, uh, expanded by, by Beck and Cohen, and they called it super statistics. Uh, and they assumed that the measured probability density that we have is a superposition of individual Gaussians, but each of these Gaussians has its own diffusivity, and then we average over the diffusivities. One example could be the experiment by Perrin. I told you the particles were not perfectly reproducible. So each particle had a bit of a different size, and when you use the Stokes-Einstein uh, formula, of course, each particle had a different diffusivity. Uh, you could also think of having different diffusivities because your particles are in a heterogeneous environment. And locally, each of the particles experiences different mobility. But also what you see, this model in this formulation cannot give you a crossover to a Gaussian. The shape is always encoded in this function. So a few years later, uh, uh, an old colleague at uh, uh, Ottawa University, Gary Slater, and his postdoc, they had a, a very beautiful idea. They called it diffusing diffusivity. Uh, years before that, we looked at a similar process, but we never, I, I didn't make the connection to this uh, phenomenon at that part, point. And what they thought is, okay, I view my particle following a Langevin equation as the one you have here. So I only wrote, wrote it for one dimension, but you can generalize that to any. Uh, so our particle displacement is given by white Gaussian noise psi. But now uh, Gary uh, had the idea of modulating the diffusion coefficient. It's a stochastic process itself. It's fuzzing around. So the idea is as the particle moves through a heterogeneous environment, once the diffusion coefficient is larger, when it hits a more dense area, it's smaller. Uh, and this is being captured in this model. And then there were some other groups working on this and we wanted to have a model that can be solved uh, analytically all the way. So we came up with this minimal model where we uh, model the diffusion, the diffusion coefficient as an Einstein-Uhlenbeck process. So we map it on this variable y, 
We square that so that the diffusion coefficient is positive, obviously, that's what we want. And Y itself follows this einstein ullenbeck process, which again is diffusion in a harmonic potential. And when you solve this uh, whole thing, the first miracle, I mean, you can prove it exactly, uh, the mean square displacement does not show any crossover. It has the same coefficient at all times. When you divide it by T, you see it's perfectly constant. I should actually say this, this was work with uh, Alexei Chechkin and Flavio Sena uh, from Padua and Igor Sokolov from uh, uh, Berlin. And then when you look at the probability density of displacements at short times, they're perfectly exponential with a little bit of power law correction at, uh, uh, that's relevant at the uh, origin. And then you have a crossover to a perfect Gaussian shape at longer time. And this is also encoded in the kurtosis you see here. For this one dimensional example, the exponential uh, distribution has a kurtosis nine, and then it crosses over to a kurtosis of three for the Gaussian, and it happens at exactly the time scale set by the einstein ullenbeck process here. And this was really fun because at one point we ended up with a Laplace transform of the result, and we found um, a paper, a mathematical paper that gave us the exact Laplace inversion. So that was really cute. Uh, so it's, it's the, uh, the one model on the market that has an exact solution. Uh, what I showed you for the uh, um, mean square displacement here, this of course depends on the initial condition we put there. And here we used a thermalized initial condition for the diffusivity. If we don't do that, you can have more complex uh, uh, behaviors of the mean square displacement, as you can see here. I will not go into details. Um, another system that we analyzed were similar effects, but they are a little bit different occur. They are studied by my colleague Karsten Beta here in Potsdam, and they measure individual amoeba cells that move on a simple two-dimensional surface on a cover slide. And what we see in these uh, experiments, of course, these are cells, you don't expect them to have the same diffusivity or activity, if you want to call it. Uh, but the funny thing is when we increase the lag time um, with respect to which we measure the displacements, the longer the lag time, you would naively assume the longer the lag time becomes, it uh, gets more stochastic, it becomes more towards a Gaussian. And actually the system for long, for increasing lag times, more and more approaches an exponential. So this is something that's still a puzzle and we try to uh, convince Karsten to do better experiments so that we can have some more basis to understand what's going on. By now, many different models. I think I'm running short in time. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll go quickly here. There are many different models that look at different aspects of this non-Gaussian distribution. One that I like very much comes from my old friend Eli Barkay in Stasbourg at uh, uh, Barilan University. And they actually use a very simple random walk picture. But typically when we go from a random walk and we want to look at diffusion, we take the limit of many steps or long times. And this of course produces the Gaussian by the central limit theorem. But let's assume we want to look at the tails of our displacement distributions. They correspond to outliers in the system. And we want to do this for a finite number of jumps. So this is governed by extreme value statistics. And uh, what they showed, this will exactly lead to exponential tails. So that's maybe one of the clues why for a given number of systems, the exponential is very, very uh, widely observed. You can have your tracer particles, they become smaller, larger. Uh, Ellie again, uh, with a postdoc, they looked at multimerization that you have in typical biological systems. We, we're just writing up a paper with uh, our two Japanese friends where they simulate a single protein molecule that has uh, conformational transitions between a larger and a smaller uh, um, configuration. And there also we see uh, our fluctuations of diffusivity and uh, we get these non-Gaussian uh, distributions. And there are other uh, um, models that I will not go into. Um, I don't know, you probably saw the uh, message from uh, uh, Christian. You can download all these, these slides from uh, our server here. Now, uh, so far, I always 
referred to a mean square displacement that's linear in time. Normal diffusion in the sense of the mean square displacement, but not necessarily the probability density. Now I want to go to anomalous diffusion, and that's typically, in most cases, systems where the mean square displacement goes like a t to some alpha. And when alpha is smaller than one, this is called subdiffusion. That's typically when there's some obstacles or whatever in the system. Or you can also have superdiffusion when alpha is larger than one. That can occur, for instance, in systems like biological cells when there's active processes involved. But of course, to get to anomalous diffusion, you have to get rid of some of the restrictions that Einstein or Smolukowski used to describe Brownian motion. You have to break the central limit theorem somehow. And as you can guess, once you do this, you know this from other phenomena in statistical mechanics, you lose universality. So all of a sudden, you can have many different causes for anomalous diffusion. And one of the key features now, when you look at it from an experimental point of view, when I measure data, how can I identify which physical process is behind? And so over the years, people have a lot of these processes. I will not go into details. I just show four of the most prominent ones. And if, you, if I were going through with you, uh, we have many different features that are different uh, for each of these individual processes. And we will look at two of them in particular in the rest of the talk. Um, I show you one thing, and this is uh, my, my third case for uh, fluctuating quantities. Uh, I told you before, even Brownian motion, when we measure it for a finite amount of time, of course, if you think of it as a random walk, you have a different, slightly different number of jumps each time you measure. And we can quantify this in terms of a time average of the mean square displacement. So here we just measure the displacement as a function of a time average. And this is the result, that's my notation for it, that's the result from a single realization. And then I average over, uh, uh, I, I normalize over the average from many realizations, as I define here. So this quantity, when it's very close to one, uh, for uh, uh, when the distribution is very close to one, it means that the process, the measurement is reproducible. In the limit of very long times, one can see that the distribution for Brownian motion becomes a delta distribution because it's perfectly reproducible. It's a self-averaging uh, uh, process. Uh, but you can see that at finite measurement time, capital T, the uh, variance of this distribution is still finite even for Brownian motion. It just goes to zero as you increase the measurement. Also for another process that uh, uh, Christian and many of your uh, uh, soft matter people will be familiar with, you have this fractional Brownian motion. That's a process that was defined by Mandelbrot. Maybe I quickly go back. This is defined here. So it fulfills a normal Langevin equation, but the noise is no longer delta correlated, but it's power law correlated in time. So that's a typical feature you can, for instance, uh, derive for the central uh, monomer in a long uh, Rouse model chain in a polymer chain with bead and springs. Uh, it's a typical feature of viscoelastic systems. And we'll see it again later on. And it's, one can show it's uh, um, reproducible. It's ergodic in that sense. And indeed, for typical measurements, you can see that uh, one uh, uh, time average is on top of the other. Uh, when you now look at the fluctuations, when you uh, make a cut at one given uh, lag time, you see distributions like these. So they're almost Gaussian. Uh, for superdiffusion, they become non-Gaussian, uh, but still they're typically relatively narrow. If we look at another diffusion process that we'll also uh, encounter again later on, that's a random walk process, if you want, that gets immobilized, but the immobilization times are very, very broad. They actually, uh, uh, they no longer have a characteristic scale. And it's a process that even occurs in biological systems, but is much better known from condensed matter. Oop, what did I do? Um, and in this case, you see that this distribution becomes much, much wider, and it even has a finite value at zero uh, mobility. So that's very typical for these processes. And in this case, this is asymptotic. The time average in this case will always remain a random quantity. But what we know is that, for instance, distributions of these kinds can actually give very vital clues for what's going on in the system. 
Uh, here I want to quickly uh, address both this subdiffusion and the superdiffusion in the very same system. These are experiments that are done by Christine Selhuber at the University of Kiel. She just managed to get a beautiful uh, uh, job offer at Heidelberg University, so I'm looking forward to visiting her there. Uh, and she's looking at amoeba cells. They look very complicated. There's lots of stuff in there and there's lots of active motion. You can see things swirling around there, driven by uh, molecular motors. Uh, and you can see that when we look at this alpha in the untreated cell, the alpha is very super diffusive. In some cases, it's almost fully ballistic. But then she works with biologists and they want to find out where uh, uh, what causes the motion and everything. So they uh, poison the cell with different uh, chemicals and the one that inhibits the, uh, the activity of the motors, you can see all of a sudden the alpha becomes very, very small. And in this case, the displacement autocorrelation looks like this. It's very characteristic negative dip here. That's exactly what is given by this fractional Brownian motion by the viscoelastic systems you have this negativity, and that is what Mandelbrot called anti-persistent motion. Think of your monomer in this long polymer chain. If the central monomer gets a kick to one side, all the nearest neighbors that do not get the same kick, they uh, uh, have a restoring force onto this particle. They push it back. And this happens on the time scales of the nearest neighbors, next nearest, and so on. And this actually leads to this anomalous diffusion and to this very characteristic uh, displacement correlator that you have for viscoelastic systems. Uh, it's actually, uh, you can show mathematically that the area under this curve is exactly zero in this case. But then these cells, they're very sturdy. After some time, they, the motors, they, they move again. And then you can see that from this uh, anti-correlation, the correlation becomes positive, more and more positive, and then the active motion sets in again uh, and dominates this super diffusive motion. And in all cases, then, of course, the distribution of the apparent diffusivities changes. Now, typically, when we're theorists, we like to evaluate all these mm, things in terms of mean square displacements just because we like spatial averaging. But uh, people doing simulation and especially experimentalists, they, they uh, use power spectral analysis. So we wanted to know, can we have a similar time uh, uh, average uh, definition for the power spectrum? And indeed, we, we uh, found this and we analyzed it for different types of motion. So this is my power spectrum. It's just defined as the Fourier transform of my time series of the position of the particle. I just use a one-sided Fourier transform here, absolute value, I square it. And here we have uh, those systems and some we, we haven't talked about before, but some of them we, we did, uh, where we have fractional Brownian motion, this correlated motion uh, of, the, of the particles. Here we have two subdiffusive systems and two super diffusive systems. These are those vacuoles I was just talking about in the amoeba cell. And this is the motion of the amoeba cells themselves. And what we managed is when we calculate this time averaged uh, power spectra, we could also calculate, as we had for the amplitudes of the uh, mean square displacements, we have here the amplitude distributions of the power spectrum. Because you see different realizations, these are experimental realizations, we have amplitude fluctuation. Some system is a bit more active than the next and so on. And you see that the calculated distributions and the data, they match perfectly or almost perfectly. So these are uh, single particle checking experiments. The circles, probably red circles here, I'm colorblind, so uh, Christian knows. Um, they, this is the full two dimensional resolution and the blue uh, symbols here, this is when you project them down on a single dimension. So you see this perfectly matches apart from this uh, little initial uh, uh, part of the distribution for these vacuoles. And here we thought, well, our method is maybe not as good as we thought, but then we looked at the trajectory, tra trajectories and uh, uh, what, we see, what we saw is that locally 
you see this viscoelastic anti-persistent movement of these guys. So they're being pushed about by the viscoelastic environment and at larger amplitudes, you see the effect of the active motion. So actually this analysis is extremely sensitive uh, and we were really amazed how well it worked. Um, yes, let me skip this. We, this is just getting us too far away. Um, so can we ask more about this system when we go to simulations where we have um, either atomistic or coarse grain detail, we have the individual trajectories and I show you that we can find out a little bit more where this non-Gaussianity comes from. Let's start with a simple system. These are just uh, uh, caricature models that we uh, used in simulations for biological membranes. Uh, so they are built up of little lipids. You can maybe see them best over here. Uh, they have a little head group and that's hydrophobic. So it's being exposed to the water layer and they have two tails per molecule and they're hydrophobic. So in, they, they try to self-assemble as this bilayer to shield off the hydrophobic parts. And at room temperature, these uh, lipids, the membranes, they look like this. And then for instance, we can look at the mean square displacements. They look at this. Um, and the correlation of the displacements has again this dip. So it's again one of these viscoelastic systems with this anti-persistent motion. When you follow the motion for longer, you see crossovers, and this is very uh, dependent on the exact configuration that we have. And we could uh, actually describe all this by again fractional Brownian motion, but with given cutoffs of the uh, uh, correlations that we have. Um, and I'm happy to get into these details later on, but I just wanted to quickly flash up the system. It's viscoelastic and I want to rather ask the question now, what happens when we make it more heterogeneous? And typically in these membranes, what you have, uh, this is a top view now of the same system. These are all these small uh, uh, guys here. These are the lipid molecules. And this is now a protein, a protein that can be dissolved in these lipids uh, and these are coarse grain simulations uh, on the level of these, these blobs that you can see here. And the atomistic detail is, is kind of in the shadow in the background. Uh, and this is with a single of these proteins. And then we stuff more of these proteins in there. And what we realize, the single protein system is perfectly Gaussian. When we plot one minus the cumulative uh, and we take a log, then we get exactly the R square scaling inside the, the Gaussian here, and it's beautifully reproduced. But once we go to these systems here, when part of your lipids may be enclosed by these big uh, chunky proteins, others can, uh, now I almost wanted to use my finger to point onto my screen, uh, others can move pretty freely around in, in the bulk. And when you look at the average, you can see that it's no longer a Gaussian system. It deviates strongly from Gaussians and we fitted that by an e to the minus r absolute with some delta. So when the delta is two, it would be a Gaussian. When the delta is one, it would be exponential. And we see uh, uh, anything from 1.2 to 1.7. So it's quite strongly non-Gaussian, but it's not exponential. And for the system then we, analyzed uh, individual trajectories. And here, this is the clearest we, we found. We, we see some intermittent behavior. So th this lipid can be very mobile and all of a sudden the mobility drops down. And we can then pinpoint this to trapping periods in between uh, these big proteins. And also instead of having a relatively focused distribution of our, our, our diffusivities, in the case of the crowding, we get a very broad distribution, maybe by modal, but that's fantasy. Uh, for the simulation, the soft meta people uh, of you, it was very interesting that almost the same features we could even see in a much simpler system. This is just a 2D uh, system of argon uh, molecules. We can use the same simulations approach to simulate them. And these are mobile ones, free argon particles. And then we have obstacles, the dark thingies. These are just clusters of fully immobile argon molecules. So the mobile ones, they have to squeeze through here and they have a much reduced mobility here. And we see this, this bimodality and non-Gaussianity in this very simple system already. It can also be shown that this is present in 
experimental studies, which of course is very important because uh, experiments, they resolve different timescales from the simulations. So also in, in experiments you have, for instance, uh, exponential distributions of uh, the displacements. So also there in, on these longer timescales, this is relevant. Good. Um, we have modeling approaches for this. I just flash up the papers. I have something with Jakub Schlenzak and uh, we are just trying to publish together again with Flavio uh, and Igor um, this diffusing diffusivity model, but now we combine it with this coelastic diffusion. And there's beautiful crossovers and uh, uh, discontinuities are uh, in as a consequence. So uh, uh, we're having fun, but the I don't know, the referees don't seem to be that uh, 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 intrigued by it. So we'll see what will happen about this. Um, Non-Gaussianity you can have in a whole range of systems, and I will not go into them, just flash up, uh, for instance, in crowded systems or when your, your tracer is not as simple as you might think. My, my postdoc then, J.O., he, he called it a Mercedes star. Uh, uh, tracer because he had this, I don't know, these four molecules, these blue blocks arranged like a star. Uh, so in many of these systems, we see similar uh, features, but typically they're transient. So again, we have crossovers from uh, non-Gaussian to Gaussian uh, behaviors. The final few minutes, if I have, can, can I use a few more minutes? Uh, because that's now one system that's very different from the ones I discussed previously. And let me show you the experiment that uh, led to this. This is from Diego Kraft uh, uh, at Colorado State University. And they follow potassium channels in the membranes of uh, living cells. This is one micron, and this is the uh, trajectory of these, these channels. The fact that they can be so long is that they, the cell is sitting on a co cover slide and they use turf uh, uh, from the bottom. So it's a, an almost flat surface allowing them uh, uh, to, to monitor this motion for a long time. They measure for a few hundred seconds. And what they see is that these molecules, they fuzz around, they're very mobile, and then all of a sudden they uh, become almost immobilized. And then after some time they become mobile again and so on. And the uh, uh, physiological reason is that they associate with given centers that are in the membrane, and after some time they escape again. And now they measured exactly these immob immobile times and what they find is more or less an asymptotic uh, inverse power law. And that when, when we saw these experiments, we were all very happy because this is a, a process that's an old friend of ours. It's a so-called continuous time random walk. Uh, they, they were very well studied in groundwater systems or in uh, semiconductor systems, but now they also pop up uh, time and again in these biological systems. So imagine you have a random walk, but you have pausing times that have a scale-free probability density. So your alpha is now smaller than one. There's no characteristic waiting time. It's infinite when you're average. Of course, a real system, you can argue, will have a cutoff always, but uh, for uh, um, the, the, the sake of the experiment here, and also mathematically, let's just keep with this uh, scale-free distribution. And then you can show, of course, that each trajectory can have one or few extreme immobile events. So this causes time averages to stay random quantities even at infinite measurement time. It's a very typical feature for these systems. Especially one can show that the time average mean square displacement remains linear in time, but it depends on the measurement time. So intuitively, uh, while your particle moves, each time it's immobilized, the immobilization time can become longer and longer. That's just a feature of a scale-free system. On the other hand, the mean square displacement in the ensemble sense, the classical, if you want, mean square displacement, it shows the anomalous character of the motion. It's T to the alpha, and it's the same alpha as you have here. So it's a non ergodic system in the sense of time versus ensemble average. And this is what happens in the experiment. So all these trajectories are from the same system. And you see for, from, I don't know, 20 trajectories, you have uh, uh, this distribution of amplitudes of around one and a half orders of magnitude. That's huge. 
And it's really the system. It's not about students or anything, but it took people to realize this. Uh, Mungji Bawendi at MIT had similar features from blinking quantum dots, where you also have these parallel waiting times. And it took, I mean, the, the, the community to, uh, uh, to realize what's going on quite some time. And now we know it's part of the physics of the process. The second feature is, uh, as I showed you here, the dependence on the measurement time. The longer the system evolves, the less mobile it becomes apparently, and that's what exactly you see in the data. The process itself is non-Gaussian uh, per se. You don't need any fluctuating parameter here. It's, uh, uh, um, it has this, this stretch Gaussian shape. Good. So here we have fluctuating waiting times. One can refine it a little bit. I will skip through. And the last slide I have, just to show you how dramatic these effects can be. Uh, these are simulations from Jeremy Smith's group uh, where they look at the relative motion of two segments of a protein molecule. And without going into details, they see that when they look at configurations, individual configurations can be locked in by, by the three-dimensional structure and they see power low uh, escape times for this system. And now when they look at the, they have a very long time series, and when they evaluate the uh, correlation function, the position correlation for a short part of the uh, time series for a bit longer, even longer, and the entire time series they have, they see that the crossover time of the uh, correlation function becomes a running uh, time, uh, becomes a running function of the measurement time of the length of the time series. And that's what they plot here. So they see uh, more or less seven orders or six orders of magnitude uh, in time of uh, this aging phenomena of the dependence on the measurement time. And if they combine this with an uh, uh, experiment from Sunny Shi's group on the same protein, with a bit of fantasy, you can claim that you have 13 orders of magnitude of these power law effects of these aging effects in a single protein molecule. So that's quite impressive. So if we think of proteins as, as you know, more or less complex uh, uh, landscapes, but we always think at longer timescales, we should expect exponential dynamics. And here we are at, uh, let's see, this is around a thousand seconds, if I see this correctly. Uh, these are very long timescales where you still have anomalous diffusion in there. People see similar effects on surface water of proteins and so on. If you want to read more about this, we have two uh, popular articles, two physics today's, one from 2012, one uh, together with Diego uh, last year. Uh, so you can look at them in more detail. Uh, what I try to show you is that averaging for averaging sake, because we all like smooth functions, of course, uh, but if you do too much of averaging, you lose a lot of information. And despite the fact that things might look unsmooth, you can still learn from fluctuations. Maybe you recall how zigzaggy the power spectra looked for, from these, these experiments, but by taking the amplitude variation over the entire power spectrum, we could get these beautiful amplitude fluctuations, for, uh, amplitude uh, distributions, for instance. So I showed you fluctuations in reaction times. If you really take the whole uh, resolution of your first passage time uh, density into account. We have fluctuations of diffusivity in some relatively innocent looking uh, colloidal systems, in biological systems. Uh, we have fluctuations on the single trajectory level of uh, our time averages, mean square displacement, power spectra. We have aging uh, uh, where fluctuations are asymptotic and you see this aging behavior, this time dependence on the measurement time. Uh, for these last systems that are introduced to you. We work on many other fields. For instance, we try to connect what people use in time series analysis, type financial time series, and so on. There's beautiful mathematical techniques, for instance, ARIMA or GARCH uh, methods to uh, analyze time series. And we try to see what is the physics encoded in them. And we, we wrote a first paper again together with uh, Jakub Schlenzak here uh, last year. And we also try to extract information from uh, trajectories that are measured by using either Bayesian uh, maximum likelihood or machine learning 
uh, approaches, but this is relatively at the beginning in my group and I didn't include it in this talk. Uh, you can see some open access review articles here, uh, but I just want to uh, finish here, just flashing up as we do uh, the funding uh, and the friends that I had the pleasure to work with over the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. So virtual claps for your uh, beautiful talk. It was really uh, very accessible, very inspiring, both uh, from the historical point of view and also for the ramifications that I would say intersect aspects related to the research of everybody, uh, both the theorists and experimentalists. So for the benefit of people that uh, joined the, the uh, lecture after the start, I'm sharing again the link to the slides because these people would not have access to the uh, chat before they joined. And now, of course, the, uh, we are open for questions. So please uh, raise your hand or write in the chat and I will uh, unmute you so you can pose the question yourself. Christian, I think Giuseppe Mussart and Andrea Gambassi already raised their hand. Okay. get to I the attendees, yeah. Uh, right, okay. So uh, uh, I, I cannot click on them. So Laura, can you unmute them? Yes, sure. So I'll start with uh, Giuseppe Musagdo. I allow you to talk. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sure. Okay, good morning. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have uh, just uh, um, the following questions. For uh, Gaussian uh, Brownian motion, the magnitude of the fluctuation uh, is described by the law of uh, iterated log. So it's a famous result by Kolmogorov and other. For non-Brownian uh, uh, motion, is there uh, an analogous law? Not for all the processes. We don't know it for all these stochastic processes that we have. Um, asymptotically, we could get it, for instance, for random walk models, for instance, these continuous time random walks, which is much more difficult are these long range correlated types of motion. So this fractional Brownian motion uh, is, is a very difficult process. It's, it's very widespread uh, in these uh, biological and soft meta systems, but um, there's no way of calculating these things there because it's, it can't be mapped on the random walk. So there is no such, uh, no such law either uh, depending on alpha, let's say. I parameterize my, my motion uh, by alpha and then I get the equivalent one. There yes, it's, it's not that easy, but that's, that's the only example where I know that, that essentially nothing works. Um, even, you know, much simpler things um, like um, first passage you have a semi-infinite uh, domain, you put an absorbing boundary, there's no exact solution known for the, uh, the probability density for this process. Mathematically, it's a nightmare. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. So, uh, Andrea Gambassi, now you can unmute yourself. Andrea, can you pose the question? Uh, can you hear me? Very faintly. Uh, and there I think your mic is off. Can you hear me? Ah, just a second. Let me check my. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, very well. Okay, sorry, sorry for this technical. So, so that, Ralph, in in in, so uh, it, so quite generally speaking, you know that the if uh, the role of, uh, the actual role of fluctuations depends on uh, also dimensionality and interaction. So, uh, what changes if in in what you said? I mean, in the fluctuations of all this quantity. You said, I mean, I mean, you have large fluctuations, so. Uh, you, you, have, uh, you have very often uh, uh, loss of self-averaging. What happens if you increase or you change the spatial dimensionality for these processes? 
It depends which one. So for instance, if we start with the last one where we have these uh, power law waiting times, this, this is present in all dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, when we go to the very beginning, the diffusing diffusivity, there uh, dimensionality only changes uh, subdominant um, effects in the sense that you still get a short time exponential, but the power law in, in I mean, you, you have a, a, a position dependent power law. This is changing its, its exponent. Um, when you go to, oh yes, I have a good answer here. Uh, when you go away from this pure continuous time random walk, there mm -hmm. you have a very clear dependence on the uh, dimensionality when you go to the quenched system. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a, a, a landscape uh, where you can hit uh, traps and you have to get, you have to escape thermally from these traps again. Then the higher the dimension gets, the rarer you will find these traps mm -hmm. if you view them as, as points in space. And there you have a crossover then uh, from this, uh, the quenched nature of the process to one that uh, uh, is perfectly annealed. So the exponents are changing and uh, um, the, the, the Green's functions are changing. It depends very much on the system. Right. Because also if I may add, so, so the other point would be the interaction because I mean, some years ago for completely different reasons, what we could, what I studied the case of, uh, of um, uh, fractional Brownian motion, essentially, well, it was a field theoretical language, but essentially it was a fractional Brownian motion. But then when you add the interaction, so if when you go beyond the single particle uh, scheme and you add interaction between the particles, what we realized is that, for example, uh, in, in the cases in which you would have expected at the single particle level super diffusion, because of the interaction, there was a sort of renormalization to yes. standard diffusion. So I was, I was wondering whether something similar happens also I, I, for other quantities. It should when, happen. It should happen. We, we, we haven't looked at it, um, but, but it's, it's clearly there. I mean, even uh, um, when you think of, of generalized Langevin equation motion that describes your, your monomer in, in the polymer, uh, go to a, a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional uh, harmonic network, of course, there will be differences. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So Angelo Rosa has a question. Angelo, you are allowed to talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks. Uh... Now you're gone. Angelo, can you try again? Yeah. Does it work now? Now it works, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, I, I would like to go back to your diffusing diffusivity model. Um, so my, my question is, at some point you showed some curves for the mean square displacement, where, uh, um, I mean, at uh, early times, these uh, curves were like uh, proportional to T square, and uh, at late time was proportional to T. Yes, this one. This one here, right? Yes. So uh, that reminds me a bit of the classical worm like chain model from polymers, uh, where uh, the mean square, I mean, where you, if you do the mapping, so then you have to talk about the um, mean square end to end distance, right, between mm -hmm. monomers. And yeah. uh, for a small number of monomers, this is, it grows, uh, I mean, uh, proportional to the square of the number of monomers, then it goes mm -hmm. like uh, n, right? Yes. And uh, did you, I mean, do you think there is some, can you map uh, to, to that model in some way? Or... I mean, he, here the, the, the physical reason is, is different. Here it depends on the initial condition. Okay. So here you get this uh, ballistic scaling when you start with a diffusion coefficient that's smaller than the thermal average value. I see. And okay. so the system is heating up. Okay. And, and this is then producing you the additional okay. T factor. Uh, you, you, you get this diffusion drift to the larger okay. values. Uh, but what people did do is they connected this diffusing diffusivity picture with polymer models. There's, I think, two papers out mm -hmm. uh, at the moment where they, they look at these effects. And, but then in these models, it would be superimposed 
on the dynamics you already mentioned. Okay. So they can get even more crossovers Okay. And they claim this is heterogeneous environments and whatever. But, okay. but here it's a very simple physical origin. Thanks. Thank you, Angelo. Are there further questions? Okay, I don't see any uh, further questions. Let me see, maybe there is a... Uh, oh, right, there is a question. There's a Q&A, yeah. In the question and answers. So, uh, can you see that, Ralph, or do you want to... Let me try to it? find it. So, I, do you have access yes. to it? I, I, I can read it out. Um, so, this is from Elena, and she asks, single cortical neurons show intermittency in the time series, scale-free firing rate fluctuations, and power law behavior in the rate power spectral density. How would you approach modeling of this behavior for single neurons as you show this dynamical movement of the ion channels in the membrane can already lead to this? I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know enough about the model and how the signal comes about, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to discuss this. Um, at the moment, I just don't know anything about the system and what exactly is measured. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have a long day ahead of meetings, especially for uh, Professor Metzler. So I think uh, we can close uh, the plenary lecture here. Thanks to everybody, especially thanks uh, to Professor Metzler for this very inspiring talk. <coughs> Thank you.